I'm Gabriela Fresquez, and this is Radar 2022. Typically on Radar, we dive into one topic, but this time we're featuring una mezcla of our favorite segments, making this episode particularly special because it's the last one. And since Latinx people aren't shy about our drawn out despedidas, why should ours be any different? If some of the topics we covered made you uncomfortable, good, because that was the point, to talk about the things we sweep under the proverbial tapete, but also the things that divide us, politics, religion, and of course, gender neutral pronouns. What are your thoughts on the word Latinx? It's completely disrespectful. It's inclusive. It's okay, it's good. Yeah. I think it's a beautiful term. I mean, there are new languages created every day. Klingon, Dothraki, like all this shit. So what, we can't add Latinx? People are gonna get pissed at it? I mean, this is America. Not agreeing on stuff is pretty much our whole brand. It's more of embracing that inclusivity of, hey, we need to make space for other individuals. So. Let's use the X, but also recognize that you can be Latino or Latina también. We're on the streets of Miami Beach asking people about sex. Okay, kids, who's horny? High school, we just talking about it. Like, nobody wanted to bring up the cl Why? And since then, slanging it. That's it, slanging it. A sex positive person is accepting of other people's ways of life, and they realize that what is their jam may be somebody else's yuck. Sex before marriage. Mira, hoy en día, stone them. Eh, me parece eh, que es mejor. Jugueticos. Me, sí, podría ser, ¿por qué? <laughs> yes. Vibrators. Yes. Flogging. I don't know what that is. When I came out, the extent of my sex ed for my parents was don't wear a dress and don't get AIDS. As a queer person, it's just harder because there are two straight people that have just like never talked about sex, much less queer sex yeah. in a way that's positive and not as a joke. Doing my research on the raíces of reggaeton, I've discovered that some of the pioneers actually had the direct intention of creating the beats per minute of the music, having it synonymous with the movements of sex. <laughs> I'm always asked, ¿Por qué la música mexicana? Why Spanish music? <laughs> I don't know, it was just something that I was drawn to. There is so much to be proud about in our history and culture, and I felt like, why are we waiting for other people to celebrate us? I love talking about the people who broke barriers and people who paved the way for me to be here with you right now. Six years ago, McGraw-Hill textbook was blasted online for referring to the Atlantic slave trade as bringing over millions of workers from Africa to the southern United States. This is just one singular but significant example of how our education system looks at history through a white lens. I'm asking people on the streets if they even know what critical race theory is and if they think we should teach the history of American racism in the classroom. Yeah, I do. I'm actually um, an elementary education teacher. So yeah, I do like highly suggest that we do. There are a lot of ugly things that took place to shape America. That's a reality and trying to pretend that it's not is a mistake. It's a, it's a silly thing to do to deny it. It does nothing for progress. Do you think women should have total control over their reproductive health? Absolutely, 100%. Uh, 100%. Do you think abortion should be legal? It should be legal. Get the government to stay out of that. People end up getting like unsafe abortions and everything. It just, it puts more people at risk. In cases of incest or rape or those things, they should have the choice, so yes. And how do you feel about contraceptives? Big fan. <laughs> Same, same. We understand, you know, what what we're up against, right? We know once what is here's the case. We, we have the trigger bans here in Texas, and we're realistic to the fact that potentially in Texas, abortion is just not going to be accessible at all. It's disproportional the majority of women and girls, the ones who end up bearing this weight of having been forced to be a mother when they are not ready to be mothers. The stats that I've read are that the U.S. economy has lost $105 billion because of the fact that women don't have access. Billion? Yeah. With a B. With a B, babe. And that's that's a letter that really matters to Republicans. Yeah, it comes right after A. For abortion. <laughs> yeah. uh, Cheers. Cheers. Oh. Give us our rights to abortion. Right. Otherwise, I will bring that baby to the coal mine I work right. at so quickly. <laughs> The patriarchy. 
Evidently, when someone asks, how are you? They're not expecting a comprehensive update on your chronic insomnia or clinical depression. The reality of our community as essential workers, we were going out there. And not only that, we were having one or two jobs, plus all the toxic stress and other issues that we have for decades. We have the, this stereotypes in our brain that we do not collaborate well with mental health. There is a, a stigma, right, that is associated with receiving therapy services. Culturally, it's seen as therapy is only for the true crazy people. We're also raised to believe that the negative feelings, right, are unnecessary. A lot of us have a lot of trauma in our history. So a lot of our families were torn apart. There was a lot of violence and that definitely had an impact. I went to catechism, did my first communion. I got confirmed, was baptized. In my late teens, gave my life to Jesus and was in an evangelical church. Lately, I've been, you know, doing a lot of meditation, trying to tap into the energy in the universe. A lot of people mistakenly think that it's the worshiping of Catholic saints. Slave masters wouldn't let these slaves practice their religion and they outlawed it. To combat that, the slaves started disguising the Orishas behind Catholic saints. The traditional worship that we do, um, it's found in the Yoruba land of Nigeria. A lot of women want to reconnect with their spiritual birthright. So they are finding different African religions or ATRs, which is African traditional religions, to be a part of. Americans pretty much all agree that legalizing weed is a good idea. When states like Colorado and California are pulling in over a billion dollars in tax revenue every year, other states and even other countries need to follow their lead and legalize. My family actually uh, is very religious, so me using cannabis is something that I've always hidden. Lisa, who is also known as Vaccine Queen, created an online platform to celebrate black and brown women within the cannabis space. They've branded me the female face of cannabis. I was about 27 years old when I phoned my lawyer and I said, find me the best state to where I could invest in marijuana. California was not a good state to invest in, so I packed my stuff and I moved to Nevada to start the empire that I have now. Covering stories from the lens of our communities isn't the norm, not yet anyway. But on radar, it was the standard. And uh, there were a lot of issues to choose from. From environmental justice, to income inequality, to a never-ending pandemic, it's been a dysfunctional couple of years. And at a time when misinformation is rampant, we did our best to keep you in the know, up to date, and as far away from QAnon Reddit threads as possible. Even though I lived in a, in a predominantly um, immigrant neighborhood, a lot of us were black, right? There were Afro-Caribbean, Dominican, Puerto Ricans, and the intersections of blackness and being undocumented places you at, at a very big risk. Our school was a whole bunch of first generation immigrant kids, uh, kids from Ecuador, Dominican Republic, Mexico, Ghana, Senegal, Haiti, Jamaica, just all chilling together. And the incredible thing is, none of this is new. I still hold on very much so to the traditions and culture and food uh, stories, you know, uh, from my culture passed down. Unfortunately, due to my immigration status, I have not been able to return to Venezuela. Uh, I do consider myself bicultural uh, in a variety of different ways. I've grown up in the United States and consider myself uh, Venezuelan-American. Uh, and even though I'm lacking that piece of paper, I think uh, it's incumbent on me to continue to represent both cultures. We have a relationship to the earth that is so ancient, we cannot deny it. It only makes sense that when you're tending to it, you would ask that person who deep, who knows that, who has that knowledge. And right now the caretakers of these lands are saying the earth is crying for help. Three out of four assassinations of environmental activists occur in Latin America. Indigenous peoples are disproportionately targeted in these attacks despite being only 5% of the world's population. My mom had cancer, my brother had cancer, my sister had cancer, my other sister that was alive at the time had brain tumors. We were only 40 miles from Trinity site.
Paul is referring to the site where the U.S. government detonated the world's first nuclear device as part of a top-secret effort codenamed the Manhattan Project. The project was rushed, and given its top-secret nature, residents near the Tularosa Basin area weren't warned before or after the detonation. Radioactive fallout from the Trinity test landed in cisterns and holding ponds and was ingested by vegetation and livestock relied on heavily by the community. When we found out that there had been a fund set up that was compensating other people, paying restitution, etc., we couldn't believe it because we were the first people ever exposed to radiation any place and we had been conveniently left out. America's obsession with the lucrative genre of true crime centers around one heavily recurring narrative, missing white women. Unless you are a young white woman with blonde hair, blue eyes, your stories are not sensational enough. While one missing person story may receive a barrage of media attention, like say in the tragic case of Gabby Petito, others, particularly black and indigenous women, will often get little to none. I think it's sad that to tell the story on how I ended up covering the Mia Marcano case, I, I really do have to reference the Petito case because it is linked. Continua la búsqueda, pero aún no hay respuesta sobre el paradero de Mia Marcano. The fact that we were there, they felt like we were supporting them. By now, you've likely seen the horrific images of Haitian migrants being chased down by U.S. border agents on horseback. And if you haven't, well, now you have. And so, you may be wondering, who exactly are all these people? And how did they all get there? We need to ask ourselves, why are people not knowledgeable about American politics or American immigration are showing up to a border as asylum-seeking people from another country? They are facing a lot of oppression. The idea of cultural appropriation has always been rooted in a power imbalance. It becomes especially problematic when the thing that's being appropriated has a particular cultural or historical significance. The Chile Queens of San Antonio were in all the plazas in the center of the city. They were so good, the food was so delicious, that it transformed city, uh, the downtown city of San Antonio into a tourist destination. Why is it an untold story? Because they were run out of downtown because they were not looking like the types of people that San Antonio bureaucrats and politicians wanted in San Antonio. You wanted Mexican food without the Mexicans. We need to get beyond solely valuing selective aspects of someone's culture more than the humanity that created it. But if you don't give a f about the Mexican people who created them, I hear Taco Bell has some amazing deals on their late night menu. Radar spent a lot of time celebrating the diversity of our many communities. In our staff alone, we represent cultures from more than seven different Latin American and Caribbean countries. So when it came to expanding representation for Latinxes, we didn't wait around for someone else to include us when we were certain we could do it a hell of a lot better ourselves. We have a history and we have transcestors, okay, that we can look back on and we can learn from. Sylvia Rivera, to me, means a great deal personally. She is someone that I model myself after. I grew up hiding who I was. I had to wait till I was 18 or 20 years old to be who I am and uh, freely express that. The best advice that I can give any parent who has a trans child is, you know, be your child's best friend and ally in this world. We have helped thousands of people get housing. We have helped Thousands of people get a green card, work permit, citizenship. That person can say, you know what, if Ruby could do this, so can I. I think that we have um, a really rigid conception of what it means to be a, a boy or a girl. The contribution of queer folks in, um, in what is Latinidad, right, um, are, are massive. When I was a little boy growing up in Puerto Rico, I never even imagined that, I, number one, I was gay. Number two, I was attracted to be a drag queen. And number three, that this was going to be a possibility in my life. So it's Pride Month and there's celebrations all over the country. June's for us and we're going to celebrate no matter where you are. Gay, lesbian, bi, non-binary, non-gender, trans. You're welcome. Let's celebrate. Let's live love. Happy Pride! Thank oh, you. No. <laughs> 
advocates and influencers have shown us through first-person experiences what it's like to live with a disability. And many continue to dispel misconceptions about what those day-to-day -day experiences look and feel like. I was on photo shoots with the cane and people started asking me, the cane is such a cool prop. And I'm like, oh my god, no, it's not a prop. It's like I need it to walk. Oh, it's like they actually thought, thought it was a prop. prop. Like it was just accessory. I was building a platform based on educating others about disability, inclusivity, diversity, and the self. I will be optimistic when I sell my TV show. I'll let you know once Hollywood green lights that, and then you'll know that the tide has officially turned and disability is in fact in. So the next time you see me rolling in the aisle at Target, don't call me brave, but do have your people call my people. Many people assume that since deaf people can't hear, that must mean that they can't drive. Obviously, you need to be able to hear your windshield wipers when it's raining, right? Right. I'm really glad that I was able to find that voice trying to create more roles for deaf people. If you grew up with immigrant parents like I did, you're probably familiar with the pressure of assimilating to American culture. I love my Mexican roots. I got that instilled in my blood, but I'm also very American and I'm proud of that too. The USA taught me how to break a lot of our generational curses, how to work hard. I'm definitely bicultural. Both of my parents are from Colombia. I was born and raised here in the US and it's influenced me in the sense that I love listening to Spanish music because it uplifts me. Still, others have been criticized by fellow Latinxes for assimilating too much, aka being too gringa. What? Why is everybody looking at me? I understand I'm white passing. I understand that I, you know, was born with a set of privileges and this that make it easier for me in this country. Simultaneously, I, I feel very much Venezuelan and I feel like that's who I am and that's how I grew up. And no habla español. If the only Spanish words your English speaking friends know are culo and perreo, Y'all know it didn't come from the Duolingo app. See, if you're Latino, you know what reggaeton is your entire life. And if you're not, I'm sure that you've heard of reggaeton or papeton songs with songs like Despacito featuring Justin Bieber and Daddy Yankee. Latino is a culture, not a race. And yet, there's a tendency to respect and assign black aesthetics. And as long as it's on non-black Latinos, everything's all good. ¿Qué es eso? Let's do better. Latinxes account for over half of America's population growth. Like reggaeton in South Florida, we're everywhere, and usually too loud. Para ser aceptado en la comunidad, lo primero fue un poco difícil porque nosotros los hispanos somos un poquito escandalosos. El sistema de aquí americano, en un negocio o en una calle, se ve más tranquilo y nosotros no somos de esa forma. Y ahí ya no traía problemas, pero ellos se fueron adaptando que nosotros veníamos a trabajar. We all know Texas has a large population of Latinx people, right? Most of them Mexican American, but a new census report says that actually Venezuelans are starting to grow in what we call Katyzuela or Katy. Katy is just uniquely located near to the energy corridor, which, you know, that's what brought a lot of people from the oil and gas industry in the early 2000s. Yeah. So now we see a lot of Venezuelans in food and beverage industry as well. The one thing I learned is that the number one um, issue that we face is the lack of information that is available to us in Spanish. So I decided to start Noticias Montaña. I'm definitely not surprised that people don't think that there are many Latinos in Montana. You see things going on in California and New York. A lot of people from those states actually migrate here to Atlanta or to Georgia to get away from all the busyness from the big cities. From the enormously influential neo-expressionist Jean-Michel Basquiat, whose work made statements about racism, classism, and the wealth dichotomy of New York in the late 80s, to performance artist Ana Mendieta's work exploring society's role in perpetuating sexual violence against women, the Latinx community is rife with dynamic artists whose work addresses many of the most pressing social and political battles of our time. The activists that are in the arts have been affected by something personally. I wasn't into this diversity work when I saw that it affected my daughter at the age of five, uh, that introduced me to understanding the leverage that we have as creative people. I always understood that El Salvador was home and LA was our second home. I use words um, that are particular to El Salvador, like Beni. I have a poem named Bayunca and all of these things because I, we grew up with seeing other versions of Spanish normalized and not our own. 
talking about gentrification, talking about issues that matter to us, talking about what's really important in our community. And that, I feel like, is the most powerful part of painting these large-scale murals, hands down. <laughs> Every year on October 31st, Americans spend billions of dollars on elaborate costumes, spooky decorations. A different holiday rooted in exploring the boundaries between the living and the dead, however, is Dia de los Muertos. As preparations for Dia de los Muertos in Sioux, I'm going to be taking you to some of the most significant places in Oaxaca where they happen. The way that we Mexicans celebrate death, we cherish, we think that we had these people that are no longer with us to, to be a part of our lives. Radar is not your abuela's new show because our goal was to confront taboos, yes, but also because we're focused on the future. You, the audience. You are familia of bicultural, bilingual 200 percenters. You who understands what it's like to have immigrant parents, to exist in two worlds, or who struggle to explain things like technology or veganism or bad bunny to our elders. Your son has been doing excellent. Oh, ella dice que son de campeón. He might be gifted. Gifted. Really? On a scale of one uh, to ten, ten being so queer, you're just like actually vomiting rainbows. Where do you fall on the spectrum? Uh, probably closer to ten. Oh, okay, great. Okay, Francis, congratulations. I mean, I'm straight. <laughs> and Jody, now can I ask you, have you ever uh, kissed a man? Yes. I'm so sorry. Me too. <laughs> Whoa, look at those huge dinosaurs. Wow, they're incredible. You, you want to look back there? No? Okay. Wait, wait, wait. It's coming towards us. It's coming towards us. Oh my God, oh my God, it's coming to get us. Everybody out of the car. No, 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 no. Marcelino Serna emigrated from Mexico to Texas in 1916 at the age of 20. He wanted to be a U.S. citizen so bad that he was like, hey, you guys, I love this country a lot, and I really want to become a citizen, so I'll fight for you. So the Americans were like, okay, come to Europe with us and fight in World War One." Y como buen latino, Marcelino era tremendo chismoso. So one day in France, he saw an injured German soldier, and he's like, tu sabes que? I'm going to follow this dude to the trenches, which he did. And there he found all the German soldiers and fired four freaking grenades and he came back to Texas as the most decorated Texan. This one's for you. Si buena me puede dar un combo número 2 con papá agrandada y refresco de dieta que tú ordenan. Oh, what? Sorry, you were speaking too fast. Sorry, I meant what are you going to order? Quiero papitas. Always so. Santis. Maito, ¿qué tú tienes allá en la espalda? ¿Estás seguro? Ay, ¿qué tú tienes ahí? Oh. It's a tattoo. Oh. Oh, what? It's a tattoo. ¿Qué hice yo, Dios? ¿Qué hice yo? Con eso, ahí atrás no puede ser doctor, no puede ser enfermero, no puede ser abogado. Hay un montón de doctores que tienen tatuajes. Eso cosa de gente baja. We're proud of everything we've covered, and more importantly, how we covered it. It's been a privilege. I'm Gabriela Fresquez, and this is Radar 2022. Hasta luego. Thanks for watching Radar 2022. Please like, subscribe, and comment down below and let us know what issues are important to you. Because let's be honest, we've all got issues. Some of us more than others. <laughs>